This is the Prayer Culture Podcast, where we talk about building prayer into the lives of Bible-centric churches and individuals. I'm your host, Michael Green. I have a background in missions to the Islamic world, as well as being the founding member of Puramore, a ministry that is dedicated to developing a deep culture of prayer within local churches and communities. My co-host, Patrick Rowe, is a board member of Puramore, as well as being a longtime church planner in the greater Houston area and Thailand. This is the Prayer Culture Podcast. As a reminder, the Prayer Culture Podcast is a ministry of two or more, which is a crowdfunded ministry. So if you enjoy this content, please check out our website and giving page listed in the description. Also, when you have a second, hit the like and subscribe button. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Prayer Culture Podcast. It is Advent time. So... Uh, we're going to be talking about Advent prayer today. I have Daniel Miller on. What's up, everybody? Yeah. Hi, I'm Daniel. I am on the board of two or more, and so it is my pleasure to be here today. And uh, this time, I was on the inaugural episode, and I did not hold the mic up close enough. So I am making sure to do that today, so you can hear my voice. And um, I am happy to uh, sort of take the helm for this episode and ask Michael some questions because he's been doing all the the heavy lifting, all the question asking. I will just a little secret about that. Asking questions is way easier than being the one who has to answer them. So I love just asking (laughs) questions because I can just listen. And sometimes, (laughs) and sometimes I can hide behind them and forget that I need to contribute. So I think this is a good, a good moment for you to contribute. It is. It really is. So first question, who is Michael Green? Michael Green. Well, uh, Michael Green loves Braveheart a lot. <laughs> he tries to do that Scottish accent, you know. I'll have a lot of fun with it. But now you have to do your Irish accent if I want to do the Scottish. Oh, man, I, I don't want to offend anybody. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, a good accent. You should do it. I like to try to talk like an Irish person, but I can't do it very well. So I shall not do it for the remainder, but I like to try sometimes. Uh, Um, And that was something Michael and I would do a lot when we worked together. Yes, yes, we worked in the same company. And Daniel was a great blessing to me, still is, especially in some of my hardest seasons in life. The Lord really used him, and uh, I feel like we've been just discipling each other a lot. So yeah. I don't know if people still say ditto, but uh, it's definitely... You said it. <laughs> I said it. <laughs> uh, definitely right back at you. And uh, it's been a blessing to know Michael, and he's definitely been a role model for me in pursuing that um, abiding life of, of prayer and seeking the Lord. So grateful to be here today. So I actually, knowing that we're talking about Advent, I'd love to sort of start by asking you, why Advent? Because, I'll give you the context, because like my family, we didn't really grow up like celebrating Advent. Like we'd celebrate Christmas and everything like that. But I didn't even like hear the term Advent. And it's not like we we didn't love Jesus and, you know, go to church, but we just didn't really talk about Advent. We were just very non-traditional as far as uh, traditions go. Yeah. Uh, So I didn't hear that term until like maybe, I don't know, 10, 10 years ago. Sure. Or 15 maybe. So my question to you is why Advent? What's what's the purpose of Advent? Or why should people celebrate it or, or seek the Lord during it in this time? Yeah. Well, and I think a lot of us grew up in a context that was, I don't know, quote, evangelical, you know, where there's this stigma about tradition um, yeah. where it's like we don't want to get into tradition because it's inauthentic. Right. It's um, It's too mechanical. It's not real, you know. But there's been a shift to where uh, a lot of churches and a lot of people in our streams are like, oh, tradition can be really good and really profitable in your walk with the Lord and your prayer life and how you operate um, to have some tradition that that can be authentic. It can become inauthentic, but it also can be authentic. And so, so with that, a lot of our streams, a lot of people have been using this Advent thing. Hey, let's do Advent. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. I, to be honest, I'm not a church historian on the subject of Advent. So um, all I can say is 
the Lord's encouraged me with some practical ways to approach the Christmas season and the leading up to the birth of Christ. Just some some passages I pray through and ways that I, you know, want to teach my kids. Um, usually we will do like an Advent Bible study, you know, or Devo like with, um, I think we've used Paul Tripp's the last few years. Um, but um, but something God's been encouraging me and just very recently is like, hey, pray more scripture, pray more scripture. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so some things this season I've been doing have been really centering around, hey, what scriptures in the Christmas story or in the pro- prophecy about Jesus' birth, all that stuff, can I pray through, can be part of my prayer life. And so, yeah. Yeah, well, that's good. So uh, question, why, like I, I love that you're talking about, you know, praying through scripture and kind of finding ways to do that. But what's so special about Advent scripture as opposed to, like, why can't we go do a four-week series of prayer on like God is our shepherd, you know, and like pray all those different scriptures and lead our kids in these like Bible studies and, and like what, what's so special about Advent prayers? Sure. Well, I'd say there's nothing special about them. Uh, and I'm say I say you could do a four week study on praying through shepherd passages, like do it. <laughs> if God says, Hey, do a, she- a study on shepherd passages, do it. Yeah. I'm all about doing exactly what God says to do. Um, I mean, I, I don't always, but I want to, like, that's, that's my advice to anybody is Mm -hmm. like, you got, what do you want advice on? Just ask God and do what he said to do. (laughs) That's it. And that's something you've told me like (laughs) countless times, sometimes to my chagrin is, did you pray about it? Just pray about it, Daniel. (laughs) And I'm like, I frustrate a lot of people with that answer. Just, (laughs) did you ask the Lord? (laughs) Uh, uh, And I hope people will say that to me because I don't always turn to that. And so, but I would say there have been things like when I'm in the Christmas season, there is a good lightheartedness generally that people have around Christmas. You know, there can be all the like commercials and all that bad stuff, but there's also like, especially if you have authentic Christians who love God, I, I do get a lightheartedness around Christmas too, you know? Um, I hate when the songs start in the grocery stores like five months before Christmas, <laughs> but when we get to the Christmas season, I'm excited about it. I enjoy it. I, I like trees. I like gifts. I like all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. And so when I go to the Lord, what I'm finding is Christmas music that's about Jesus. It's not about Santa Claus gifts, but it's about Jesus is super worshipful. Mm-hmm. And it's yeah. Mo- a lot of it is very much based on liturgy and yeah. tradition. Yeah. And so we went to gather night the other night and they were singing Christmas songs and I was just worshiping Jesus like mm-hmm. crazy on these Christmas songs that, you know, as a kid, I sang without any, you know, yeah. understanding about yeah. it. I'm like, oh, this is just a Christmas song. Yeah. It's, it's Christmas time. No, this is honoring the birth yeah. of God incarnate. Yeah. And those are some of actually the most, some of the most beautiful worship songs ever written, like are, are kind of passed over by so many people because it's like, oh, it makes me think of trees and presents and all that. Um, couldn't agree more. That's yeah. so good. So Advent is an interesting thing for me because, like I said, we didn't really celebrate it growing up. But my church this year, we started doing like an Advent kind of lead up to Christmas. And so every every Sunday, we'd like light a candle and read a scripture and we have a different family doing it. Um, or a different individual doing that every every week. And I actually got to do it. I got to do one of the prayers. And that's like the most tradition like I'm used to in my, in my uh, spiritual walk. Uh, but it's been really cool because I think that the focus of the Advent scriptures and prayers are, it, it's really special, I think, to our faith because it, it talks about, and I think that the, the song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, is like probably the pinnacle because of that term Emmanuel, it's all about like God with us and we celebrate. I mean, that's really almost the thing that's that sets I mean, it's not the only thing, but it's one of the, the main distinctives of Christianity is that we believe that God came down and he's with us. And m- maybe this bears repeating, but I, I was joining with a couple of my friends from church as, as we were um, ministering to a or just just hanging out with a uh, a Muslim family in in the Houston area and uh, we were asking him questions about, 
you know, heaven and paradise and like, what, what is paradise like? Is, is God there with him, with you? And, and he said, no, 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 no. God is not there. Like he's too high and holy and he's too much for, for us. And I was thinking like, wow, that's one of the main differences in our faith is that we believe that yes, God is high and holy and way above us, but the fact that he would care to be with us and like, our hope is not just in like we'll have, you know, it's not the Elysian fields of the Romans. Like we're just, we're happy and we have everything we want in the afterlife, but like without God, like what, what does that matter? Um, and so it's that beautiful picture of that. The incarnation is what sets us apart in a lot of ways. It's like Jesus, God came down to be with us. And I think that's why I think Advent is maybe just such a powerful thing for so many people. And I, and I love that. I haven't really thought about that before now, I guess, so I mean, in some ways. but I love that. Yeah, fellowship. Fellowship distinguishes us as believers um, because the God of the universe, creator of the universe, all-powerful, wants, doesn't need but wants and desires relationship and is willing to go to great lengths and great cost to himself to accomplish that with people who are generally ungrateful and (laughs) need a lot of work to, to actually, you know, need to be saved by him to actually experience that. And so, no, you're totally right. I love that. What sort of scriptures come to mind when you are thinking about Advent? Yeah. Well, one of my favorite passages, um, well, for, I'm going to start with Luke two in the account of the shepherds. So, you know, you grow up on the child storybook Bible where the angels are kind of cartoony and and that's great, you know, but but I read this story in a different way now because I understand a little bit more about what angels are actually like. Mm. And so basically the story says, you know, that the angels came before the shepherds and it's a whole host. This is like an army, like thousands of terrifying creatures who could kill these shepherds very easily, you know, which it's interesting because that it, you don't really see in the Bible very often where a whole army of angels shows up to mm, that's right. people. It's usually one angel or something, right? Bringing a message with Zachariah with, mm-hmm. you know, all that stuff happened even leading up to that. But you have a whole army of angels that show up to shepherds. Now I lived in Africa and shepherds are dirty They're stinky. They're starving to death almost all the time. They're very thin. They don't really have that much to do except move animals around. They're just, they're not respected at all by the rest of society. And they're usually in a tough spot and they're not there because it's like some easy living job. You know, they're not sitting on the hillside with this great breeze. A lot of shepherds don't want to be shepherds anymore. I mean, it's not a great job. And so these terrifying, this whole army of terrifying creatures with great power come with a message of joy, and the shepherds are like, what on earth is going on? And the angels first say, fear not, don't be afraid. We're not here to kill you. (laughs) We're here to bring a message. We brought a whole army with us to share a message with dirty, sneaky shepherds. Mm -hmm. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in the manger. So he tells the message. Then the whole army starts seeing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those whom he is, um, with whom he is pleased. Man, that's... Like, I I never thought of that before. Like, the fact that an army of angels doesn't show up to many people in the Bible. I think of, like, Elijah and his servant. Or was it Elisha? Uh, I always get that one mixed up. It's Elisha, I think. I think that one was Elisha. Yeah. Pretty sure it was. But it's like, that wasn't wasn't really a messenger. That was just like a, hey, let me open your eyes to see what's going on. But, like, this was, I mean, to your point, shepherds that aren't, you know, of high standing, they're not important people. And God would care to send an, not just an army, but like a singing choir army to these 
like lowly shepherds. That's like, that's really cool. I've never seen that before. Yeah. And so what I do with this story is I try to put myself in that place. Like picture myself as this shepherd Mm -hmm. who has low standing, who's out in this Mm -hmm. field with nothing to do and probably really hungry. And I'm sitting there and all of a sudden angels show up to share this really important message with me about the Messiah that my people have been waiting for forever. Mm -hmm. And he's sharing with me. And then telling me that he's in a dirty, stinky manger. (laughs) It's like, wow, this is crazy. But those guys are faithful to the message and they go and they see the Lord and then they start proclaiming it. Mm. And so I, I, I want to, and when I go to pray, I like want to put myself in this story, like as a shepherd, what was it like, Lord? What is it like if I'm on the field and I see these angels, the angels that are surrounding you on your throne saying, God incarnate has come and it's a blessed message for all men. Mm. What does that look like when angels are booming this out? In Isaiah 6, it says when the angels speak, it's like shaking the thresholds. What is that experience like? And so that's one thing because I do believe in picturing and trying Mm -hmm. to envision yourself Mm -hmm. in a place that you see in the Bible. So I I think that's one good approach. And then... The other scripture that I like to pray into is Isaiah 9, which is a well-known prophecy about the coming of Jesus. Yeah, can I I read that, actually? Read it, bro. I uh, pulled that up here. Read it. I'll probably read a couple verses and then skip over to the one that we all know. Uh, But this is Isaiah 9, uh, verses 1 to 2, and then probably over to 6 and 7. It says, but there will be no more... Gloom for her who is in anguish. In the former time, he who he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end, on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Mm. When you read that passage, how do you approach it? How do you, what do you think of? What do you pray? Yeah. So I want to take the the verses and turn them back into prayer to the Lord. So a lot of times it's like, I'll read a verse and then, so like example, verse two, it says the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep darkness on them, a light has shown. So I might pray something like, Lord, I was in the deepest depths of depravity, loneliness, and despair, but your son came and brought light to my life. Mm. You know, thank you. Thank you for that. Like, this is me in that deepest, darkest place beyond repair. And Jesus brought the light into my life by coming into the world. Um, and so it's that's a prayer of thanks. Mm-hmm. Like, thank you for doing that. And acknowledgement of the gospel. Yeah. So another example, verse 6. I th- thank the Lord for this example of the Trinity, right? Like... Thank you, Lord, for the Trinity um, so perfectly displayed. The Holy Spirit, I thank you. Holy Spirit, I thank you for your counsel. Father, I thank you for your eternal presence and care. Son, I thank you for the insane peace and joy that only you can bring. Mm. Teach me how to live in that. Teach me how to walk in in the way of the Prince of Peace. Mm. Uh, teach me how to to stand up in my Father's love and not submit to the despair of the enemy or the clamorings of the enemy that I'm just never going to be good enough to receive God's love. Mm, That's good. Holy Spirit, please help me to believe you actually are real and actually are operating like in in my everyday walk and let me like walk in the spirit continuously. Mm. And actually what I think is kind of cool about these passages is, is I love how you've taken them and kind of made them really personal prayers 
And I think what you could do is is go another step further and talk and, and pray like, Lord, thank you that all of us were like who have been walking in darkness, you've you've provided a light. And it gives context to my personal situation. And it gives context to my friend or my my family member's personal situation that it's not just, you know, me picking up the Bible and reading the scriptures and it's like, well, thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me. But like, it's thank you, Lord, what you've done for all of us. And that's really the story that God's telling in the Bible of like, I give you great tidings of, of, of great joy and that she'll be for all people. And it actually gives me more joy. And I think to, to really think about like beyond just myself, Mm. um, when it's, and it's kind of a shift that we have, I think would be really helpful in a lot of our worship songs also is to, to talk more about, to have more congregational songs. And some need to be very personal, but but a lot of, I think what we could do is think more congregationally. Yeah, um, that's so, good. But, but I think what you're saying is also really important that it, it really personalizes it because when you read like a lot of these prophecies and maybe Old Testament scriptures, it's like, well, what does this have anything to do with me, you know? living in the 21st century. Sure. So what, so what else do you, do you look at and pray whenever you're going through these passages? Well, I do believe that one thing that tends to be severely lacking in our prayer life and should be really in almost all our prayers is a desire for the Lord's return. Mm. So when I'm reading through a passage, I'm like, Lord, how is your return involved in this passage? Mm. If it is, maybe he, maybe it's not a passage about his return, but I always want to be asking the Lord to come back mm. because that's that's what Jesus talks about in the book of Matthew when he talks about um, they will fast when the bridegroom has right. gone away. They'll cry out right. and 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 mourn and desire his return. And that's what the oil in the lamps is for the wedding feast. He told parables about people who were not ready because they didn't desire his return. Mm. I want us to desire his return, mm-hmm. you know? And so for me, I, I want opportunities. And so like when I was reading verse 7, it says, read verse 7 again of... Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Yeah, forevermore. So my personal prayer there is like, Jesus, I'm so excited for your eternal kingdom to be fully realized on this earth as it is in heaven. Can you come quickly and do this thing that has been on your heart for eternity past? And that's such a beautiful thing because that's like exactly what we're talking about, like that's the like the meta narrative of the Bible. That's the story God's telling. And to ignore the return part, and to just talk about like you know I'll be in heaven forever, and and like it's it's not complete because that's not like God's heart has always been. And I think the story that He's trying to tell is one of being with us and being our God, and we're His people. We're the sheep of His pasture. He's our shepherd. It's never like we're like alone in the in the nice green pasture with all the 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 grass we want, you know, it's like, yeah. it's not complete with that. And, and I love that, that perspective that you're bringing, like, how does this relate to the Lord's return? Um, and it's something I need to think a lot more about, but, but just like, it's, it's, it's a completely incomplete picture if we're not having that in mind, because his, his desire has always been to dwell with us. And, and I love that from verse seven, when it's talking about, he's going to sit on the throne and I mean that you just think about Revelation 21 or 20 and 21. Of, yeah. Um, the new heaven and the new earth. And so... And the um, beauty of this, I think this can apply to anybody's eschatology. I'm not trying to like yeah. say, hey, have yeah. this eschatology. All Christians believe Jesus is going to come back and judge the earth. Mm. Um, and so all of us should be mm. asking for his return. Yeah. And that should be so integral. I, I mean, I, I run across this term uh, gospel-centered or gospel mm-hmm. a lot, which a lot of people seem to mean the death of Jesus on the cross, and that's about mm. it. Yeah. But the gospel is a whole story. Yeah. And when I talk to my kids about the gospel, ask them what the gospel is, I expect them to share about the creation and sin of humanity, the coming of Jesus, who was perfect, unlike everyone else, and then his his life, his death on the cross, his resurrection, his ascension, and his return. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. without all those elements, you don't 
really have the gospel. You have just parts of it, but you don't have the whole thing. Yeah. And so I want to be praying into all those elements, even when I'm praying at Advent, Mm -hmm. that something the Lord keeps laying on my heart is like, hey, there's so much in the New Testament, so much, Mm -hmm. even prophecy in the Old Testament about getting zeroed in on, we Mm -hmm. want our husband back as a church. Mm -hmm. I want to pray into that. I want that to be at the forefront of my mind and my prayers. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I, I I just feel like this theme which, I mean, I don't think we were planning, but it's just this beautiful theme of like, I mean, it's the reunion, the family reunion. It's like a husband, like coming back from a long journey, a long work trip and and coming back. And like, I remember those days, you know, when my dad would come back from a work trip, it's like, daddy. And we'd all like come down to the stairs and, and uh, we'd like jump from the highest step that we could and he'd catch us. And, and, and it's like the story's not complete without the husband, the father returning, you know, and being with us. I think there's a Piper quote that was talking about that passage from the the wine skins and all that, talking about um, how his his absence is is painful, and it's meant to be painful um, until he returns. Uh, so that's good. So I'd love for you to share with us a little bit of whether this passage or the passage from Luke, like what are some things, again, we're not about like, uh, traditions and making people do stuff like you said at the beginning. It's all about doing what the Lord wants you to do. But what are maybe some ideas that you could give for families and individuals and uh, churches even to to think about praying into Advent? Yeah. So you you mentioned something your church has been doing, and we did that at um, the church I used to be at too. Um, I was up at through last year, but I, I'm not at that church anymore, so I've been doing it this year. But I love the lighting the candle and having a passage every week that is related to that. I think that's a beautiful way to remind people in your church. Um, just have passages that are about Advent, whether it's a story or um, about um, or prophecy. Mm-hmm. And um, there's plenty of prophecies to go around, so you won't <laughs> run out, I promise you. <laughs> uh, and then... I'm about prayer meetings and like people getting into it with the Lord in that way with two or more. And so in two or more, like introducing passages like this and saying, Hey, let's meditate on this passage. Mm -hmm. Let's, you know, picture yourself like the shepherds. Let's have some time of waiting on the Lord before we start talking to him. Let's, let's wait Mm -hmm. and see what he wants to teach us from the story of the shepherds, Mm -hmm. you know? Like maybe the thing about the army, maybe that's something he wants to teach me about more. Um, Or, or Isaiah here, like, Hey Lord, what do you want to teach me about your birth? You're coming here about your return, about Mm -hmm. the Trinity and wait on him to share things with you. And, oh man, he's so faithful to do that. So Mm -hmm. really, really, I know my advice is, can be somewhat frustrating because it's just ask the Lord. (laughs) But um, make space for him to share things with you from Scripture, not extra biblical things, but things that are in Scripture, and he can give you a deeper understanding of those things Mm -hmm. that will really drive your experience with the Lord in the Christmas season. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Are there any, um, like, books or devotionals or anything like that that you found to be very helpful for yourself regarding Advent or... Maybe not even specifically Christmas type. I haven't got it out this year, but the last two years we've been doing "Come Let Us Adore Him" um, mm. on a yearly basis, and that song is the amazing. Last couple of by years. the way, it's a good oh, come one. All you faithful, yeah. that's one of the greats. Yeah, so it's "Come Let Us Adore Him" by Paul Tripp. Um, it's it's been a good one for us to go through, and I've really enjoyed it. So I keep thinking of like we're, we're, as we're you know talking about the return of Jesus and how that's integral to the gospel. I keep thinking of that scene from The Last Battle by C.S. Lewis, the, the last book in the Narnia series, and how, like, I remember listening to that on, on audio, like, you know, when I was, I don't know, maybe 17 years old, and my heart just, like, burst out of my chest with, like, aching and longing, like, oh my gosh, I want to be there at the end. And then um, I think maybe I re-read it or re-listened to it at, at some point after that. And I remember being, and I remember this because I was looking in my old journals the other day and I, I found that entry. I just randomly happened upon it. But I, I was talking about that scene again. And I noted that like it wasn't complete 
like the the like it was amazing. It was this beautiful scene of like all their old friends and everybody who had ever lived in Narnia who yeah. had, had you know loved Aslan, and um, they were there, and it was like this incredible reunion. And Narnia was even better and more beautiful than it was before, but it like wasn't. It still wasn't complete without Aslan showing up at the end, um, mm. and. And then there's that beautiful moment where the the king of Narnia and and like comes trembling face to face with there there he stood like his true heart's desire huge and real or however Lewis put it, it was it was so poignant but it, you read Narnia I'm going through with the kids right now we're on the silver chair now hey me too I'm actually reading it oh come on yeah. come on we're on the silver chair and um, but his constant every book he's so intentional about. Whenever Aslan enters the picture yeah. at all, there's yeah. this, it's different. Yeah. The atmosphere yeah. changes entirely. And I love how he did that to build up to the return of, of Aslan like, a, mm-hmm. hey, this is wholly different. This is not yeah. just some regular earthly experience. This yeah. is like the Lord of the universe is stepping in the room yeah. and you can feel it. Yeah, And yet every moment of those scenes, it's like... Lucy or whoever it is, is just like so overcome with joy and she runs to Aslan. And it's like, that's what it's meant to be like. And I think Prince Caspian does a great job of that. I know we didn't, we weren't planning on talking about Narnia, but like, <laughs> I think Prince Caspian does a good job of the, the book, does a really good job at showing the, like the painfulness of his absence. Yeah. Um, and it's like, well, where is Aslan? Why hasn't he, why hasn't he done anything yet? Um, yeah. So, yeah. It's so good. I think it's 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 such a good way to remind us of what the gospel is all about, and it's a reminder of God's mission is to have your heart and my heart, and all of us together with Him again in the garden. You know, kind of a mm. a family reunion, and I, I, not that we don't talk about that during the rest of the year, but I think maybe talking about Advent or the, the season of Advent is a, is a good time to remind ourselves of that. Like Easter is, we have a whole nother focus, right? Yeah. Um, or, uh, you know, that Passover week and everything, totally different focus, but this is a really good time to maybe focus on the, maybe the overall, you know, meta narrative that he's, he's telling. That's true. I haven't really thought about that way, but that does make sense. Like, does that make me sound smart? I mean, I, I think so. Well, you're you're a storyteller, and um, I think you're an excellent storyteller, whether you think you're an R or not. But I think you're an excellent storyteller because, well, and you. that's what you do for a living. Like you tell stories, that's what you do. And so, you know, I love that you can use language like that, and you actually know what you're talking about. Whereas, <laughs> if I say meta narrative. I don't even know what the heck that means. I know what narrative means, kind of. Uh, <laughs> it just means the, the big story. The big story because the birth part is like, well, he's just a baby. He can't really do anything yet. Well, no, but the whole story is God becomes flesh at this moment in time. Mm-hmm. He steps into time in this moment with the entire purpose of showing that he's – who he says he is to mankind, dying for their sins um, as part of his plan from eternity past, you know, and then rising from the dead and being seated at the right hand of the Father until he returns. Yeah, I mean, I, that makes sense to me. That's that's why I'm really excited we talked about the whole narrative here to some mm-hmm. degree, you know, with our prayers. And yeah. and the, the Isaiah prophecy is very much about the whole narrative. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's right. Totally agree, man. This has been really uh, encouraging to me and spiritually enriching. Come on. Come on. That's good. Well, was there anything else that you wanted to share about Advent? Uh, Merry Christmas. And Merry Christmas. don't hit your diet too hard. Um, I know it's tempting, <laughs> but you won't feel good. So this is a message I'm telling myself, but hopefully it'll encourage somebody else there <laughs> to stick with their diet and uh, and be good during Christmas. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Yes. Merry Christmas. To uh, Merry Christmas, everybody. As a reminder, the Prayer Culture Podcast is a ministry of two or more, which is a crowdfunded ministry. So if you enjoy this content, please check out our website and giving page listed in the description. Also, when you have a second, hit the like and subscribe button.